Hello again, everyone. I waited until the last possible minute to submit my final version of this presentation because, as everyone knows, this pandemic is still rapidly evolving, as are the restrictions related to it. My hope is that you will find these strategies useful for current travel uh, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and future travel as well, once we're in a different place with COVID-19. And there certainly can and will be future pandemics. And some of these strategies, as you'll see, could be useful during more normal times, non-pandemic times. So let's jump right into it. Now, this isn't a presentation about why we travel, but I would like to briefly address this question because, of course, during a pandemic, the bar should be higher for why we are traveling in the first place. And of course, there are a lot of reasons why people travel, including family, work, volunteer responsibilities. And then there's also our human desire to connect with friends and recreate and take a break from work, which for some people can be very important for their own health and potentially their clinical performance. There are a few different reports like this one put out by Medscape that show similar stats. This one showed that 44% of U.S. clinicians have symptoms of burnout. And this survey was done before the pandemic even started. So preliminary data suggests that this number is going to be even higher over the past several months. What is burnout? Well, it turns out it's going to be included as an official diagnosis in the ICD-11, which will be coming out in 2022. And burnout is marked by three main things, emotional depletion, detachment and cynicism, and low professional achievement. And probably not a surprise that more mistakes are made by burnout physicians and nurses. Burnout leads to errors. And for some, even a short trip away from their home area can help alleviate the symptoms of burnout. Of course, many people don't need to travel to maintain wellness. But for some, especially those living in large urban areas, travel and access to wilderness areas is something that helps keep them grounded and rejuvenated if they're able to do so safely without breaking any state, county, or work guidelines. Safety and access are the two main themes of this presentation, how to optimize them and how to make them convenient enough so that our travel is enjoyable. Well, we might as well start with some travel restrictions and it's a bit complicated because there are federal restrictions and then there's some state and even county restrictions. So let's talk about the federal restrictions and I'll give some examples of state and county restrictions. But of course, it's important to check with the state and county that you're traveling to or from prior to travel. Okay, what's the deal with the new CDC requirement and testing? You've probably heard about this. It became effective January 26, 2021. It applies to anyone, including U.S. citizens two years or older, that come back into the United States by air. On the surface, it's pretty simple. You need a proof of a negative test to get back in, but there's some details that can be confusing. So the requirement is satisfied one of two ways. You can have a negative test no more than three days prior to your flight back to the United States. The other way that you can meet this requirement is if you've recently had COVID-19 and you can show documentation of recovery. And so that's proof of a positive viral test and a letter from your healthcare provider or public health official saying that you're cleared to travel. And I think the idea there is if you take a PCR test, for example, that's highly sensitive, you may still get a positive test, even though your doctor thinks that you're no longer contagious. But the recovery from COVID-19 has to be within the past three months. And the CDC put the burden on the airlines themselves to check for this documentation. I think they figured, why not give them one more thing to do during the pandemic when demand has plummeted and they're just trying to stay in business? And there's a huge Q&A section on the CDC website that is uh, updated often. And one of the first questions I had when I saw this requirement is what types of tests are acceptable? And the CDC has left this pretty loose. It could be a nucleic acid amplification test, like a PCR test. It could also be a less expensive and typically quicker antigen test. It just needs to be authorized by the relevant national authority in the country where the test is administered. So the test you take in Costa Rica, for example, may not be approved or authorized in the United States. And that's okay per this requirement. And whether or not you've been vaccinated for COVID-19 or you have documented antibodies for SARS-CoV-2, it makes no difference for this requirement. 
In addition to proof of a negative test or a, a recent recovery from COVID-19, you also need to fill out an attestation document that confirms that the information is true and your airline should give you guidance on how to fill that out and, and where to access that. Okay, a bit more about this testing requirement and the timing of it. So let's say you're in Mexico and your flight back to the United States leaves at 1 p.m. on Friday. When could you get your COVID-19 test? Well, again, the CDC is trying to show some flexibility with this. So it turns out it could be any time of day, the three days prior. So you could get it at Tuesday at 7 a.m., Wednesday, Thursday, or even the morning of your flight, assuming that you can get your negative test result back in time to actually show the airlines. So my recommendation would be in this scenario to plan to take your test on Tuesday or Wednesday, and that gives you an extra day in case something goes wrong with the test. You're not able to get it or they lose your result. You still have potentially uh, a day to try to take care of it. So where do you get your authorized COVID-19 test? Probably the most convenient would be your hotel or resort that you're staying at. Many of them are offering free COVID-19 testing as a way to entice travelers and make it more convenient for them. Testing centers are popping up all over the place in airports, near airports. This is a picture of a rapid testing center in Salt Lake City Airport on my way out here to Montana. Another option is a, a mail-in test, and this is one that's authorized in the United States. It's a popular option for those traveling to Hawaii to meet their requirement of a negative test to, uh, to enter the islands of Hawaii. And this is a company called Vault, and they uh, essentially guarantee the results will be uh, returned within 24 to 48 hours. It's a saliva test. They actually um, have you turn on your camera and uh, someone witnesses you taking the test before you uh, then put it in the package and send it back. Um, it's about 120 bucks. Um, there are different programs. Um, again, some packages or airlines may subsidize the cost of the test, etc. Other countries have their own versions of a, of a mail-in test. So this is also an option. The thing I don't like about this option is you can see the big red banner at the top of this website that says significant weather events in the U.S. are causing delays in shipping. And that's always a concern that you send your test in and the result doesn't come back in time. Um, another problem is if you scroll down here, they do have the possibility for there to be an, an inconclusive test result, which only happens in about 1% of cases. But one out of 100 people are going to schedule this test and have it come back inconclusive, which means that they can't board their flight with a negative test result. So not my preferred option, but certainly convenient for those, um, especially living in the United States, where rapid testing in some areas is pretty tough to access. Many airlines have resources to help you find testing locations. Let's take an example here. I'm traveling from Costa Rica, see testing centers. And in some cases, it's not all that helpful. In this case, it basically refers you to the US Embassy in Costa Rica, but actually relatively helpful because now you can go to this site and if you read through this enough, you can follow this link for a complete list of testing locations. And then you will need to figure out what region of Costa Rica you're in and what testing centers are there. There's also this app called Verify that is supposed to make it more convenient for you to show your negative test result to the airlines. And I haven't tested it out much, but I have looked at it on the Apple App Store and it's rated two out of five stars. So some people certainly aren't happy with it. Maybe all the people that gave it a one star rating tested positive for COVID-19 and took it out on the app. But regardless, I would recommend if you can print out a copy of your negative test result, take a picture of your negative test result on your phone in addition to using an app like this if you choose to do that. I've been to a handful of airports over the years that do not accept electronic tickets, for example. And I can't imagine some of those airports are gonna to wanna to deal with an app like this. Both Hawaii and Alaska have restrictions for travelers from the lower 48. 
And for Hawaii, it's you have to have a negative test within three days of your flight to Hawaii, or you can quarantine for 10 days upon arrival. So of course, most people are opting for the test route. And for Alaska, it's a little bit less strict. Um, you should arrive with proof of uh, a qualifying negative test, or upon arrival, you can get a test, but follow strict social distancing until the results arrive. And as things change, there's a potential that the county that you're traveling to has their own travel restrictions and guidance. And Los Angeles County is an example of that. All visitors from other states or counties must self-quarantine for 10 days after arrival with few exceptions. Enforcement of something like this has proven to be difficult, but this is the travel advisory. Okay, let's take a break from travel restrictions and talk about the relative safety of air travel from a disease transmission standpoint. And a person who's done some of the most research on this topic is Professor Joe Allen from the Harvard School of Public Health. One of the things that he and his team have done is use CO2 monitors and other tools to measure the air quality uh, during different times of the travel experience. And here's a video clip from an interview that I did with him. How about air travel? How safe do you think air travel is? And what are some of the most high risk parts of air travel? Yeah, so I'll do a little credentialing, unfortunately, just to establish that I've done work not just in buildings, but on airplanes for over 10 years. In 2013, I was um, one of the lead authors of a National Academy's report on infectious disease transmission in airports and on airplanes. So I've studied this uh, for a long time, and I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, maybe it was in May, um, that seemed to surprise people uh, because I said, you don't get sick when you're on an airplane, really. Um, and that's because... If you think about what's happening, these fundamental factors we're talking about, ventilation, filtration, when you're on an airplane, uh, the ventilation is actually quite good. So you get 10 or 20 air changes per hour. Recall the home is about half an air change. And our target was four to six. Hospitals will target six air changes, except for the most extreme, and then they'll target 12 air changes. So an airplane, you're getting a lot of air. Second, all of that recirculated air, if you remember I said uh, in buildings we like a MERV-13, that gets about 80%. Well, in airplanes, everything that's recirculated goes through a HEPA filter. That's 99.97%. So it turns out when you're on an airplane and the systems are running, it's probably one of the lowest risk times during the whole travel experience. Now, add on mass on top of that, which is an excellent idea, um, and, uh, and, and the risk gets even lower. Now, that's not to say it can't happen. Can transmission happen? Yeah, transmission can happen anywhere. It's just lower risk than, than most people think. And we have millions and millions of passengers, uh, even to date, and we have a handful of cases that are suspected, and I'm not even sure all of them are accurate, uh, a handful of cases or instances of transmission on an airplane. That said, there are areas during travel that I think are important. Um, you know, we know restaurants are higher risk, but when you're in an airport, lots of opportunities to sit at a restaurant, uh, at a bar, uh, masks come off. So I think those are higher risk. And also um, during boarding on an airplane, we warned in our 2013 report that airplanes do not always have the ventilation systems running while people are boarding. That's a mistake. And I hope I called this out on the op-ed in, in March, I mean, uh, May, and we've been talking about it ever since. Airlines have to have the gate, have to have ventilation on when the plane's at the gate. Otherwise, you are cramming a lot of people into a small volume space. When the systems are running, the ventilation and filtration are great, but they're not always running. There's two things from that segment that I want to follow up on. The first is HEPA filters, and there is some confusion and controversy about HEPA filters and whether or not they work for viruses, small viruses like SARS-CoV-2. And when I posted that interview with Professor Allen, this comment sums up the confusion pretty well. It says, I don't understand how people continue to promote HEPA filters when it's evident that they don't adequately remove particles as small as the COVID or SARS virus on a regular basis. You would need a filtration of 0.1 microns level to adequately remove 99.99% of the viral particles. HEPA filters don't do that. 
And the confusion, I believe, stems from some of the language that's used. So this is Amazon.com, and I've just done a search for HEPA air purifiers. I'm going to click on this one. A lot of them say the same thing, and this one says, True HEPA filter captures 99.97% of airborne pollutants as small as 0.3 microns. Okay, 0.3 microns. How small is the SARS-CoV-2 virus? It's about 0.1 microns. So smaller than that 0.3 that this product and others advertise. So one could read this and think, okay, it does really well. It particles slightly bigger than the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but doesn't look like it's gonna capture that. And I wanna read something to you from the EPA, the United States Environmental Protection Agency website, which clears this up pretty quickly. And then I'll show you some of the research behind it. It says, HEPA air filters can theoretically remove at least 99.97% of dust, pollen, mold, bacteria, and any airborne particles with a size of 0.3 microns. The diameter specification of 0.3 microns responds to the worst case, the most penetrating particle size. Particles that are larger or smaller are trapped with even higher efficiency. The worst case particle size results in the worst case efficiency rating, i.e. 99.97 or better for all particle sizes. Okay, now let's look at the data. This is a study put out by NASA in 2016. And there's just one chart from this study that helps clear up this issue. And you can see capture efficiency percentage on the y-axis and diameter in microns on the x-axis. So let's go ahead and add the size range for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is about 0.06 to 0.14 microns. And the red lines just show different capture methods that a HEPA filter uses, but the blue line is really what we wanna pay attention to, and that's just the total capture efficiency of a HEPA filter. And you can see a couple things. Overall, it's incredibly efficient at capturing small particles. The lowest it drops to is 99.97. But you can also see that as you get to this range of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that it is above 99.99% so it's extremely good hepa filters work they're relatively inexpensive you don't need a hepa filter or purifier with fancy features like ionization or anything like that just a simple hepa filter and a system that's powerful enough whether it's a portable air purifier or a system on an airplane or in a commercial building that is powerful enough to move ample air through that filter if you just took a nap no problem the one sentence summary is that HEPA filters work really well, including for small viruses like SARS-2. And that's great for commercial airplanes or for office buildings that have HEPA filters installed. But it's also great for travelers potentially because you can have a mini HEPA filter that you can bring with you depending on what your travel experience is like for something like an Uber ride or a taxi ride or a van transfer or other types of public transportation where you may not be able to open the windows. Maybe it's bad weather and it's, you know, it's raining and you can't really open up the windows well. So this is one that I purchased. It's uh, $40 and uh, you can get it anywhere. I think I got mine you know, from Amazon or something like that. Um, it, um, let me open this up and just show you the HEPA filter there that can be replaced. Um, I think you only need to replace it maybe once a year, depending on how often you use it. It's got three speeds. So you might be able to hear that. It actually moves a decent amount of air for something so small and lightweight. Um, and it really probably only purifies the air in a space of about five feet around me. But again, for uh, some of the situations you get in while traveling and a transfer, um, this could be really helpful for SARS-2 and potentially other viruses. Um, <laughs> I'm not suggesting be a total germaphobe and you know be the, the, the traveler in the bubble and have one of these next to you. But again, during a pandemic or potentially during the height of flu season, um, or if you're someone that's potentially immunocompromised, this could be something to consider. The CDC has finally updated their guidance on ventilation and filtration as they've recognized airborne transmission as a significant way that SARS-2 spreads. And one might think if I'm wearing a mask and those around me are wearing a mask, 
why do I need to worry about ventilation and filtration? And the reason is we know that depending on the mask, some amount of finer aerosols will escape around the mask or potentially through the mask. And over time, despite mask wearing, aerosols can build up in a confined space. And we've talked about HEPA filters as a way to filter out those particles. But another key aspect of this is just ventilation. And that's as simple as opening up a window to dilute the pathogens that may be aerosolized and increase the total air changes per hour that Professor Allen mentioned. The average home in the United States gets about one half of one air change per hour, well below the bare minimum recommended. So this is something to be mindful of while traveling, whether it's inside of a hotel lobby or at a restaurant, open up a window or sit near a window when possible. And it's good to see companies like Uber understand the importance of ventilation. They recommend for both drivers and customers to open the window and improve ventilation. Well, we've all heard a ton about masks by now, but there are a few strategies to consider while traveling. And the first is, I think about masks in two categories, very effective, less comfortable masks and pretty effective, more comfortable masks. And I think there's a place for both while traveling. Most people don't wanna wear an N95 mask the entire time they're traveling, nor do I think they need to. But I think having an N95 mask or something similar to that for the relatively few high-risk activities that you may be involved with is a good idea. For example, if I'm on a multi-hour flight, I'll choose to wear a more comfortable mask like this, something that goes over the head and doesn't attach to my ears. As you know, those ear loops can be uncomfortable over time. But for the boarding and deplaning process, when potentially those engines get turned off on the airplane, that's when I would pull out an N95 mask or something like it. And a good alternative, if you don't have an N95 mask, is a double mask, or maybe even better, a mask fitter like this that seals the edges of the mask and creates an airtight fit. This can be used with a KN95 mask or a three-layer surgical mask. Again, a little bit less comfortable to wear over several hours, but good to have with you when you need it. And don't forget about eyewear. The CDC recommends eyewear protection in areas with moderate spread of COVID-19. So wearing glasses over contact lenses or even sunglasses during more high-risk activities may be worth doing. Long security lines at an airport could be a higher risk activity from a transmission standpoint. And I'm surprised that more people haven't taken advantage of TSA pre-check. It's $85. It lasts for five years. It's fairly easy to sign up, some basic paperwork, and then you have to schedule a couple minute interview at either an airport or one of the sites that authorizes this. But the advantage is significantly shorter security lines at airports and also the ability to move through the security line faster. I signed up for this a couple years ago and it definitely makes traveling more convenient and a bit quicker. Well, we've talked about many different safety strategies to consider during the COVID-19 pandemic, but these can have other benefits as well. One example, this is CDC data showing influenza-associated pediatric deaths, and only one so far during our current flu season. Okay, so you have your safety strategy figured out and you've decided to travel. You'll need to keep an eye on restrictions, and kayak.com is a travel website, and they maintain this page that uh, I think is really convenient. Red means the country's borders are completely closed. Pink means partially open. Yellow means opening soon. And green means no restrictions. And then if you click on any country, let's say Argentina, it'll bring up more information about entry restrictions and quarantine requirements if those are in place. But for much, much more information on travel, the travel.gov website maintained by the U.S. Department of State is very informative. One of the hardest parts is getting there because if you enter travel.gov, you will get an error because that URL doesn't work. But every couple of years I forget about this and think that their website is down or something. So if you do a Google search for travel.gov, you'll see that they refer to themselves as travel.gov, but they're URL is actually travel.state.gov. So let's try this again, travel.state.gov. And now I'm in. And starting on the homepage here, the first thing I'd recommend doing for any US citizen is to enroll in the STEP program if you're going out of the country. 
and this is called the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program. And I'll zoom in a bit here on what it is. It's a free service that allows the embassy to contact you in case conditions in the country that you're planning on traveling to have changed and they want to inform you about something. It also makes it much easier for the U.S. Embassy to contact you in case of an emergency. If there's a flooding event or a terrorism event in a country, the U.S. Embassy will then know that you're there because you've enrolled in this program and they can contact you and potentially provide assistance. It only takes a minute to sign up and I'd recommend doing it. Other information that I use frequently on this site is this international travel tab. And once you're on this page, if you scroll down, you can click on COVID-19 country information, or probably more convenient is just type in the country that you're planning on traveling to. I'm gonna use Mexico as an example here. And the website brings up all this information about Mexico, including recent travel advisories. And if I scroll down, I think this map is really helpful. And what this shows is the travel advisory levels. Red means do not travel. Orange means reconsider travel. And then yellow is the lower level travel advisory, which means uh, exercise increased caution. And then going back to this page, again, you can see these different travel advisory levels. And Mexico is level three, reconsider travel. But again, that's as a country. So if you click on this, you can break it down to a little bit more granular level. These particular states are do not travel level fours due to crime. And if you scroll down further, you can read about each of these states and particular travel alerts within them. And this can be really helpful. For example, Nayarit, a state in Mexico, has some popular tourist areas such as the Riviera Nayarit, but there's also these areas close by that US government employees may not travel to uh, because of violent crime and gang activity. So good to know that in advance, um, especially for people that are considering something like renting a car and traveling through large swaths of the state. I think now more than ever, travel insurance can be a good idea. And this website that I've recently learned about called Square Mouth makes it easy to compare plans and figure out what you wanna get. And for an example trip, I put in information for a $4,000 week-long trip to Mexico. And let's see what policies come up from different companies. Okay, and it brings up a lot of policies, but one way to narrow it down is something that I would want if I was buying travel insurance and going through the process of doing this. I would want this cancel for any reason box checked, and that narrows it down to 17 policies. So I can quickly go through these and pick one that works. And what the cancel for any reason does is you can literally cancel the trip for any reason you want. You don't like the COVID-19 data coming out of a country. You have made other plans. You've decided not to travel. Your cancellation doesn't need to meet a very specific criteria set by these travel insurance companies, which is very difficult to meet. And you can see the prices are pretty reasonable from $211 up. Most of you watching this have probably spent time on the CDC website, but a quick review, if you go to Traveler's Health and then Destinations, and then you have two main options. You can get information for travelers or for clinicians. So let's select clinicians and use Mexico as an example again. And there is excellent information about vaccines and infectious diseases broken down by vector-borne and airborne and droplet diseases and other health concerns. It's a great resource. Well, we covered a lot of ground and I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So I'll wrap up here and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.